so last week we had a sports illustration or kind of a thing to think through, and I know maybe I lost some of uh, those listening, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose the other half now. I'm going to talk about a uh, cooking illustration, because uh, today's, today's um, message, I think we can see some similar applications to that. Now it works with a whole bunch of things, the guys with uh, the sports analogy and learning how to do a sport or how to even work on vehicles or mechanics or things like that. But let's think for a minute uh, cooking steps. So it, in order for us to cook well or bake well, because I guess there's a difference uh, between baking and cooking, and you'll get to see a little bit of my ignorance in how this illustration is in my weak spot right now. But uh, in, in the element of cooking and preparing food, well, if you had to teach somebody how to cook, you might start off with, this is the stove. This is the firebox. This is where things get hot. Uh, this is the pots and the pans that you put items in. These are the measuring items that you use to uh, create the creation that will uh, later tantalize your taste buds, right? So there's, there's this, uh, all these necessary components, and you would begin to point them out, and then you would teach them probably something pretty basic, uh, like this is how we uh, cook meat to this temperature, so we know it's thoroughly cooked, and, and all that. Here's seasoning, like salt and pepper. Uh, this is what it does, so that you have a good product. Maybe you're in the grocery store, maybe a little bit advanced. You pick up that melon, right? What do you do with that thing? I guess you're supposed to thump it, and if it has a, a specific sound, you know it's ripe and it's good, and you can go home and you can cut it, and there's all sorts of tricks on YouTube on how to cut a melon really easily. Uh, so there's all these ideas and things, concepts that you would teach somebody as they're trying to cook. Things like, never freeze lettuce. It just doesn't work out when you try to thaw out lettuce. It, it, and uh, don't stick an egg a full egg in the microwave because, well, parents, I'll let you explain that to your kids. Uh, <laughs> it, not, not good things happen. So you, you teach these things, but if you had to come back every time to this person and teach them the same things over and over and over and over and over again, and you started each cooking lesson with, okay, put it in the stove, and they said... What's the stove? Okay, well, let's get out the frying pans. What are, what are those for? If you had to do that, you would probably literally go crazy. Because you, you would just, are you not getting it? Are you not learning anything? This is a complete waste of time. And, and maybe someone says, you know what? I don't need stoves and frying pans. I'm going to just eat it raw. And I wouldn't recommend that either. There's a number of things that when we think through the elementary teachings that we've, most of us have come to learn over our lifetimes, we also build upon them. We don't just stay in the very first lesson. We continue to grow and build. And we learn that not just salt and pepper, but there's other seasonings and other, like if you're going to smoke meat, there's other uh, hardwoods and other flavorings that you can add to things. <clears throat> So we take things and we do just crazy things with food, and it can be quite fun. Now, in life functions, think if you had, I just overheard somebody was potty training. Can you imagine having to do that every day of your life with someone? Okay, this is the potty chair. This is how you recognize, I mean, just, we laugh and it's funny, but when we think about building upon and growing in our lives, there are so many tasks that, as parents especially, we expect our children to grow in proficiency in. And as employers, we expect our employees to grow in efficiency in. And, well, the same is true for our spiritual lives. God expects us, and the mentors that have come before us, expect us to grow in our understanding of the Word of God. They expect us to have tons of questions when we're first starting out, and to soak in that understanding and to learn from the Word of God. But then there is this desire, this expectation that God has for us 
to go deeper, to understand not just the elementary teachings of faith, but to go deeper and deeper and deeper and to apply them, not just know them, but then to actually see them lived out in our lives. And so as we dive in today, this is going to be one of those clear passages of scriptures that teaches us that point. And so it'll be helpful for us to remember where we've been before we dive in. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5 is where we left off. And last week, we were talking about how the writer was continually reminding them of their Jewish uh, backgrounds to hold fast to their confessions and to draw near to Christ. And he drew the parallels between Christ and, well, their image of a high priest and how Jesus Christ is our high priest now standing before the Lord our God. One thing I didn't mention last week that is so important that changes uh, the practice is under the Old Covenant, underneath the Old Testament law, you, a normal person, that would be all of us, by the way, a normal person could not approach a heavenly, holy God. They needed the priest to be the intermediary for them. They needed a proper priests to communicate on their behalf. And there's a number of faiths, even denominations, that carry over this idea into their understanding of spirituality. But when Christ, as our high priest, uh, he is the, he, we no longer need a man on earth to approach the God of heaven. Uh, the access has been made available to us all. And when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. It's a very important theological understanding here. The curtain is torn in two, and that which had been previously reserved for only a secluded few became open to all. And it's extremely important. If you want to go before your God in heaven and lift up your, your requests, you want to make points of repentance, you just simply call out to the Lord. You don't need another man here on earth to be that intermediary between you and the Lord, because Jesus is our high priest. Now, that was uh, in chapter 5. Now, in verse 11, because we didn't finish all of chapter 5, but in verse 11, he'll say, about this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Ouch. <laughs> But uh, sometimes truthfulness isn't always well-received or doesn't always seem like it's being the best thing that we'd want to hear. But this is what he said. We have much to say about this, about some of the, the priesthood and, and how Christ is our uh, high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And, but he says we can't, we can't go that deep because, well, you become dull of hearing. And he continues in verse 12, and he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. So they've had enough time, I believe, at this writing to experience growth. Uh, it's been around 30 years, so to speak, when Jesus had died, and we don't know exactly when they came to an understanding of Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their high priest, but the writer is expressing that there should, there's enough time that has passed, that they should be not only knowing this and have it kind of in their rearview mirror as a basic foundation of life and everything else, but they should also be teaching this. And they should not only be teaching that, but also teaching maybe even some more deeper theological understanding things. They should be hungry and they should be seeking more and more understanding of the fullness of the richness and the completeness of the uh, scriptures. But, well, they're not. And, and he continues in the second half of, of verse 12, and he says, You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Now, if you're a, a new parent, one of the most important tasks that you have as a parent is to provide not just care and clean diapers, but nourishment. 
nourishment for this new child. And, and one of the most important things a baby needs is milk. There's so many qualities uh, in, in the milk. It's a great thing. It goes down easy, and sometimes it comes back up. You know, that's reality. But it's just what they need. There's not much fear of choking because it's liquid. <clears throat> we don't start off, um, contrary to some of the trends I've seen online, we don't start off feeding a baby solid food. In fact, before we get to solid food, often we'll take the solid food after they've grown a little and been able to handle and digest milk. We take that solid food, we grind it up. <laughs> we puree it. So it's still something that they can handle and they can digest and it provides nourishment for them. There, now, it's important to understand in this, there is a time for milk. There's a time for pureed food. But as a child grows, I think our writer is making this illustration clear for us. It, we must move on from milk into what everybody loves, steak. Right? I mean, can you go wrong? <laughs> if you're a vegetarian or whatever, we'll have a conversation about that. But this, this whole idea of growing and handling more and more complex foods, it's, it's built into our, how God designed us and wired us. And so it's also important for us to understand this in our spiritual lives. So early in our faith in Christ, I want to encourage you, if you're somewhere in the beginning and you feel like, maybe I don't have a really good grasp on this, ask all the questions you can. You're right where you need to be. Keep pursuing more and more. Seek the nourishment from others. And uh, continue to hunger and go deeper. First, verse 14 there, also just a, an important concept. Uh, it brings about the concept of athletes or soldiers in training, but with purposefulness, if that's a word. It, it's intentionality. And it's not just that they have training, but it, also, it focuses on the quality of the training. It's not just that you have food, because we've got lots of food. But it's the quality of the food. And there's so much, there's so much il illustration here. I mean, I think uh, if you're in a larger corporation or you've heard of larger corporations, they will have mandatory trainings. And sometimes you can get by with just showing up and checking off the box and sitting there on your phone watching Facebook all day. And you've qualified as a trainer. <laughs> you can even become a trainer as long as you put in the time, right? But... This is getting at the quality of the training. I mean, if you were looking at someone who needed CPR, do you want the person who sat there and watched on his phone or her phone all day and then said, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm going to need you to perform CPR on me? You're going to want somebody who actually put in some good quality training and hours and they understood, uh, like hands-on even, like had the dummy there, knew how hard to press, understood that there's going to be some popping and cracking going on. I mean, because you need the job done and you need it done right. And so the quality of your training makes all the difference. And when he's talking about this aspect of training, he is not talking about just putting in the time. He's not talking about just showing up. He's talking about actually digesting it, taking it in, understanding it, wrestling with it, putting it into action, having somebody who's a qualified mentor or discipler pour into you so that you then can handle them on your own and not just handle it by yourself, but then also teach others to do the same thing. And so this is, this is so significant. And and, and when we talk about this in verse 14, he says, if we have this type of training, then we have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And if there's anything that we uh, need in our lives is that discernment between good from evil. And, and a lot of times in our culture, we'd like to think we can identify it. But there's so many things that seem very good, they just don't have a foundation in goodness at all. And so as we grow in our understanding, the power of discernment also grows within us. 
And that all comes from knowing the word, understanding Christ and his word and how to apply it. So uh, in this, he says, if, you've ne- I mean, if we just continue to look at this, it's so important. In chapter 6, then, he's going to have some stronger words for them. In chapter 6, verse 1, he gives them what I would say kind of an encouragement and yet challenge or command. And he says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, these here are just a few, I believe, of the basic fundamentals that he's been challenging them to hold on to regarding their saving faith in Christ. And so we see repentance. It's one of the very first things that uh, is spoken of in response to the gospel. John the Baptist, his message was a message of repentance. Jesus and, and his disciples, they, he, they call them to repent. Uh, faith was vitally important. John uh, records for us Jesus' words in chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, he speaks to the exiles, to the people that have been displaced, scattered around the Roman Empire, about the importance of letting their faith in God sustain them, which I think is well, it's vital in some of the parts of the country that we're thinking of right now. They need to remember their faith in God and believe in Him and His power to help them through the situations they're facing. Uh, The next mention is that of washings and Jewish washing ceremonial processes. There was lots of them, uh, tons of them, and it was for purification. And yet John the Baptist, again, he spoke of a baptism of repentance, and he baptized people in the water for repentance. Jesus and his disciples, again, spoke of baptism as a washing of our sins away, uh, of clothing ourselves in Christ, being made a new creation through baptism, And it's significant to understand that baptism, even baptism of immersion, was not isolated to the Christian faith and still isn't, actually. But it is one of the basic fundamental teachings, beginning teachings, and yet we seem to argue about it or it's created so much division and a stumbling block for some. But here Hebrews is saying it's a beginning elementary teaching fundamental thing that he calls us to understand and then move on from. And he says the laying on of hands next, being uh, there was lots of places where the elders were instructed to come and lay their hands on some for healing properties and for prayer. Uh, it was a signification of being set apart. We see the apostles' ability to bestow the Holy Spirit in an instance there of, through the laying on of hands. And we see the resurrection, which not everybody believed in, and also of eternal judgment And when we think through our faith and what we hold on to, one of the first questions we have is, well, if I believe in this system, what happens when I die? When when I believe here and now, what happens during my life? What I do during my life, is, is it worth it? And here, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that these are elementary teachings I would say that, yes, it's worth it. And the resurrection and the coming judgment and what you believe about the end of days here on earth, it's directly tied to your eternity. And these are, the cons- these are considered basics, the ABCs, so to speak, of education in uh, spiritual life. So these things the writer categorizes as milk category. But then he challenges them And he says, you've got to move on. Get ready for chewing on more. And here's the reason why he has to address this issue, uh, or why I believe he's already talking about it. Because they're stuck. They're they're not moving on, clearly. He wants to move on. We see that in chapter 5, verse 11, where he says, about this we have much to say. But, well, it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. And, and, and I want to I wanna address that word really quickly, if I can, dull. That just seems like a put down. How many of you feel like that's just mean? You're dull. 
Nobody wants to be called dull. Well, this might help. It might not. But what, he, what he's really saying there, that, that word is that uh, nothoros, which means sluggish or slothful. Now, what creature comes to mind when you think of slothfulness? Sloth. And I didn't get a picture for you just to go, aw. Uh, but a sloth doesn't normally carry a lot of characteristics that we admire in human life, except for it looks like they know how to rest. <laughs> and maybe that's the, the best reminder that we need sometimes in, in our 21st century American culture anyway, is just, we need to take time to enjoy and rest. But this idea is that of actually laziness, sluggishness. That it, it, he's actually telling them, look, you have the capacity to grow. You have the capacity to know this. You have already built this elementary foundation, and instead, you're being lazy. You're being complacent. Uh, the NIV states it this way, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear because you no longer try to understand. And he's not saying that you don't have the capacity. He's not saying that you're stupid by any means. He is saying, he's just pointing out this reality that I mean, you can go deeper. You have the capacity within you, but it doesn't, it doesn't look like you're trying very hard. And as parents, if you've ever seen that, you've watched kids, you're like, man, just try a little harder. I think you'll get it. Or as an employer, you look at employees and you're like, I think you can do better. I believe it. You're not trying to put them down. You're trying to spur them on. I think this is what a part of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to, to do for us. So he's addressing this issue of complacency. Now, so far, he has been addressing the issue of disbelief. He's been really challenging them to come back to the basics of their understanding and why they believe what they believe. Here, he's talking to them about complacency. So maybe you've been able to connect over the last number of weeks about what I believe and the foundations and the basic elements and I really do believe what I believe about the scriptures. And you've been able to take that and even hold on to it. It's been more concrete for you. Or maybe you've been like, nah, I, I don't know. I feel like that's all taken care of. It's kind of old news for me. Maybe this issue is one that really needs to take home and, you're, and, it's, and it's connecting with you. I say this in the best way. You and I, it's easy for us to become dull, lazy, complacent. And so uh, I think just maybe sit there for a little bit and do some evaluation with the Lord. Uh, maybe this is what we need to hear. When we think through it, where have we gotten comfortable? How much effort are we putting into our own growth? How much are we depending or expecting others to do for us? When we think of our faith and when we look at others as disciples of Jesus, do we see a sloth, or do we see somebody who's hitting it, getting after it? And when we think about our times of, of worship or connect or, or our Bible studies, are we, are we putting in the effort that needs to be put into it, or are we hoping to just show up and be fed? And when I think through the applications of this truth you know, the, part, the purpose of gathering is, is not just to show up and put in our time. The purpose of gathering is not just to hope to feel better about ourselves as we leave this place. Uh, it, this time is not just supposed to naturally, because we've, through this process of osmosis with this building or with me or, or with others, it, it's not going to fix everything. We've, we've got to show up and put into it. Uh, we've had some, or I've had some conversations, we've talked about it a little bit as leadership about this idea of being salty. I mean, what does salt do? It adds flavor, it adds richness. I'm going to go back to the cooking illustration. And if we show up hoping to just be the meat that gets seasoned, I think we're kind of missing the point of the gathering of the body of Christ. Our, our purpose is to add flavor, to add richness, to add depth to each and every one of us, so that when we leave this place, 
There's an aroma of Christ that's present. You know how it is. You drive downtown and about supper time, and it smells good down there. And if we are being the body of Christ that the writer of Hebrews is challenging us to, not just, not just soaking it all in, but are really putting in the effort and, and being salty for one another, that'll make us teachers. That'll make us disciplers. And it will make an impact on our community and in our world. And it'll reach beyond our state borders, our national borders, and to other borders of the countries where they need us also not to be lazy or complacent, but to really say, I'm going to grow, and this is what it's going to take, and I'm going to do it. So they have this strong, Hebrews has this extreme warning for us. It's so vitally important. And, and Hebrews chapter 6, verse 3 says this then, just kind of to wrap up. There's a bunch here, um, but he says, and this we will do, if God permits. Again, our trust is on in Him. Our authority uh, understanding is that He's the one who, who helps make it all happen. But then He goes on, He says in verse 4, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word. See all these cooking illustration words right here? They've, they've uh, tasted and have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the Word and of God, the power of the ages to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Now again, what the writer of Hebrews is speaking about here is a word known as apostasy. Uh, the word, he, he's challenging his readers who are tempted to slip back from their present state and belief in Christ into something that amounts to a denial of Christianity. Now, this is not just a, a struggling with a sin issue, but this is a complete rejection of everything Christ has done for them. Uh, one writer said, it is one thing to yield to sin, contrary to the teachings of our new life in Christ, it is quite another to abandon that new life altogether. And so this warning is of apostasy, this falling into apostasy. It was a number of weeks ago, I asked you to think about you know, the blue chairs, if they represent the body of Christ, who, who is not here that used to be present and why? Is it because they've completely given up their faith and their understanding in the word and of God and of Christ as their savior? How can we pray for them? Do you have a relationship with them? And that's what, he's, that's what he's talking about. And this idea, it's they have continually in their faith repeatedly abandoned this foundation in Christ so much to the point that their heart has become so hard that they've moved beyond their convictions of, of Christ as any good and unwilling to accept that repentance is even a possibility anymore to the point where they don't even want to think about it. So quite different than just somebody who's erring. And that is an enormous crime, as one author put it. Because what it does is, and they use this picture of taking Christ, someone has taken Christ into their hearts at conversion, they've tasted the joy of salvation that was bought and purchased by His blood, They've shared in the spirit of Christ and the spirit and the fellowship of the body of Christ, and then they have torn it completely out of their hearts. They've put them back on the cross as if it was no meaning at all, leaving Christ open to shame. And, and then he gives us this farming illustration in chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. It says, for the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. 
The New Living Translation phrases it this way. I think it's helpful. It says, when the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. And so it speaks of the person who has received the goodness and greatness of God and is able to produce a fruit. It's a blessing. But then contrasting that, he says, but if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. Again, a very harsh image that we see. But he doesn't end with the warning and the challenge or instruction to hold on and grow up with this. He, he goes on in verse 9 through 12, and he says, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. So if you were like worried and it was starting to get a bit heavy and you were feeling the weight, here's the encouragement. Though we speak this way, in your case, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish. That same word there, slug, slothful, dull, it's used right there. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who faith and patience inherit the promises. So even though he's been speaking fairly harshly, he reminds them and says, I'm not saying that you're there, but you're definitely in danger of giving up. And he wants to encourage them by reminding them of what they have done, that they have produced fruit. Uh, these, as we read in uh, chapter 10, we'll get to that, but in chapter 10, there's a reminder. We see that they had helped Gentile believers who were persecuted, and he says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and afflictions, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. That's, that's what they were involved in. That was their state. Do you know anybody who's currently in that state? He says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. I think the, the words of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, uh, this 32 and following, if you know of missionaries serving in Ukraine, if you know of, of people there, these, I think, would be great words of encouragement because those Christians... They have come to understand faith in Christ, and now their faith is being tested. They're facing persecution. They're facing sufferings, not just privately, but publicly. And I think they, they need us as the body of Christ to continue to encourage them not to throw away their confidence, which has a great reward. The hope that they have is that of eternity with Christ. And our writer of Hebrews is reminding them of the good works they had done the same. It's a good model for us. Good encouragement for us. But maybe it's not such a, an extreme case. Maybe there's someone in your life that just needs a little bit of encouragement because, well, it's been unpleasant. Not necessarily difficult, but unpleasant. Think about that person in your life who needs these words of encouragement. The hope eternal glory. Um, it, it's so important. So uh, there's a lot here, again, that we couldn't really dive into fully. I encourage you this week, just like the writer of Hebrews challenges us, take responsibility, go deeper, hunger and thirst for it, search it out, go uh, deeper than what we've gone here now so that we can imitate those in our past, who have modeled it well, who are not sluggish or lazy, because when the world looks at us, do they see people who are getting after it and strong in our faith, or do they see people who just like to show up, like to be fed, kind of like the show, kind of like the feel-good moment you get when you leave a place like this, or do they see people when all of life is hard and difficult, still have faith, still have strength? still are encouraged. And, and I think the best way to do that is to place ourselves in proximity with those people, those 
those relationships, our red chairs in the room, and model for them what it looks like. But I think it's also important for us to remember the writer of Hebrews is writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. And so for us, it's sometimes hard for us to swallow being called dull or sluggish. But that might be right where we're at. For some of us, it might be hard for us to think and be told that, man, you're, you're teetering on the line of disbelief. It might be hard for us, but it's what we need to hear. It's what someone else needs to hear. Don't just stop there. Encourage them and challenge them. Remind them of their faith. Remind them of the works that I'm sure they've done. And uh, continue to place yourselves in proximity of people who need just this reminder that faith in Christ Jesus is so worth it because we have in store for us a hope and eternity with Christ and his glory. Uh, just continue to, to, to place yourselves and pray for those opportunities. I want to read just that last uh, few verses, 11 and 12 again, as we close. I'm going to invite you to stand, and this will kind of be uh, part of our closing prayer. And I want us just to hear God speak this to us individually as if he was saying it. I desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So Father, uh, we come before you hearing these words and if there's something that we're bristled by, I pray that you'd soften us. If there's uh, points and places in our heart that we've hardened, God, that you would do a work of softening. Uh, Lord, forgive us where we take uh, the time that we have and the words before us, all the resources that we have with contempt and complacency. Forgive us, Lord, when we look at this gathering time as you know, just something that happens and we're complacent about it. Help us to come prepared, ready to provide seasoning to this time of gathering. Help us to, in our times of study, whether it's in Connect or individual studies, group studies, help us to be ready and prepared to add seasoning to that because you call us all to be teachers and so, Father, help us to get to that point. And where we need the milk uh, and those around us that need that, Father, continue to provide that. Help us prepare to chew uh, the greater things that lead to a further foundation in you. Father, this week, uh, do a work that only you can do so that only you receive the glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, church.